Okay, always back up a little bit just so you kind of keep the, the flow the way I understand it. This is what I, I give you my sense of the flow of thought in the book, explain to you why I see it that way, and then you can take that and evaluate that and see if you think I'm tracking what the Spirit is saying. In, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, John speaks of the commandment to love as an old and new commandment, and he speaks of obeying that commandment as a test of being in the light. By not loving the orthodox, the faithful Christians, that faithful community to which John is writing, the false teachers, those who are threatening the orthodox, the false teachers were walking in darkness, and as such, they're blind guides who are not to be followed. That's the point of what he's telling them there. And then in chapter, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 and 14, John assures the faithful, he assures them of their salvation in two addresses, which are variations on a theme. The false teacher's claims of insight seem to have rattled the faithful and at least tempted them to question their standing with God. Here you have people who are claiming it looks like. They're saying, listen, we are really the enlightened ones. I know that you have this idea and your sense of the gospel and these things, but we have transcended that. We have gone beyond that. And you really are missing the boat because you have not yet joined with us in our deeper understanding. So this is causing some of the people to question their relationship with God. And in, in chapter 2, verses uh, 12 to 14, he assures them, the faithful, of their standing before God. He wants to put an end to their concern that has been generated by these false teachers because that, that crack, that concern about your salvation is often exploited by false teachers to gain a fuller hearing of their heresy. If they can put you in a state of anxiety, you're now more open to saying, well, tell me, tell me more. Let me hear because I'm now rattled and I want to know I may be in jeopardy, so can you help me? And so he wants to seal off that crack, and he assures them of their standing with God. Then in chapter 2, 15 to 17, he warns them, if, if you haven't been here before, I'm just quickly kind of catching up to where we are. I won't slow down anyway, but I'm going to catch up to where we are. So this is kind of a quick review. In chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, he warns them not to love the world. See, which the false teacher's rejection of Christian ethics may have been encouraging them to do. You remember the, the false teachers have Christological errors, errors about the nature of Christ, and ethical errors where they're saying, listen, probably... Clearly, they're saying that God isn't that concerned with how you live. Why they're saying that is less clear. But it seems likely that they're saying that, listen, God only cares about enlightenment. And that once this spirit that is trapped in this worldly fallen body is enlightened, it doesn't matter how you live. Well, if that's what they're pitching, you can see how that would encourage people to worldly living. So John tells them in 15 to 17 not to love the world, and he explains that they're not to love the world... He gives them two reasons. He says, don't love the world because the world is opposed to God. You see, the world is opposed to God, and one cannot love God while loving that which is opposed to him. And then he gives them a second reason. He says, don't love the world because the world is doomed. And those who opt for the world, those who choose to hook their wagon to the world, will share the world's fate, whereas those who opt for God will be blessed and they will receive this gift of eternal life. Okay, chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. John is more directly warning here about the false teachers. And in verses 18 to 19, which we read last week, he says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, from which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they were of us, they would have remained with us. But this happened that they might be exposed, for all of them are not of us. And as I've said, when I, I put it that way, for all of them are not of us, means none of them are of us. All of them are not of us. Okay, so none of them are of us. Now, as I said last week, they had been taught 
that Antichrist, singular, was coming. That he was coming prior to the consummation of the kingdom of God at Christ's return. They knew that. That prior to Jesus' return, there is going to arise a figure, Antichrist. They had been taught that, but John says that even now, you've heard Antichrist is coming, but what I'm telling you is that even now, many Antichrists, plural, referring to the false teachers. They have come, and these false teachers are Antichrists. Well, why does he call them Antichrists? They're Antichrists because in their denial that Jesus is the Christ, as you see in chapter 2, verse 22, and in 2 John, verse 7, they express the spirit of Antichrist, as he says in 1 John, chapter 4, verse 3. They are one piece with Antichrist. They have the same opposition to God and his Christ that will be present in Antichrist. So he says he's talking about these false teachers. You've heard Antichrist is coming. I'm telling you, these guys are Antichrists because they oppose God and his Christ. They reject who Jesus is. Now, right when we ended, I was explaining that when John says it's the last hour, he is not making a statement about the length of time until Christ's return. Rather, the last hour, it's a theological category. It's a theological category. The last hour is the time of Antichrist. And John says they've entered the time of Antichrist because the Spirit of Antichrist, chapter 4, verse 3, is present, exhibit A being the false teachers, those who are threatening John's community. The last hour is not the moment before Jesus returns, but it's the time when the spirit of Antichrist is at work, a time of unknown duration that will end when Jesus overthrows Antichrist himself by the glory of his second coming. Let me read to you what John Stott says in his commentary. He says, John was expressing a theological truth rather than making a chronological reference. In view of our Lord's clear words about the uncertainty of the day and hour, Mark 13, 32, and of times or dates, Acts 1, 7, it is a priori most unlikely that the apostles would have presumed to speculate precisely when the end would come. John could state on theological grounds that the last hour had struck, but this was not the same as affirming chronologically when the last hour would end. You see, it is this, it's a time of unknown duration. The fact is that since Christ's coming, this world has been on the verge of the end. Since his coming, here's a diagram, a poorly drawn diagram, I may add. But here's a diagram. Up, I'm clicking and I'm getting nothing. Uh, oh, that's because I'm stupid. I'm clicking the wrong button. There we go. Here's history on the brink. You got to love that, my artwork. The older I get, I'm like I'm being electrocuted when I write anything, you know, just like my dad. But... Uh, this diagram, I, I'm hoping, I've shown this to you before, I'm hoping this will help you conceptualize the idea. It's from a, a 19th century pastor, a man named J.H. Newman, but it's cited in a number of commentaries, F.F. F. Bruce's, I. Howard Marshall's, Gary Burgess. See, as long as this reality, history as we know it, life as we know it, as long as it continues, it does so on the brink of Christ's return and the consummation of all things. However long God and his purposes extends the time since Christ's coming, Christ's coming is ever at the door. See, any time it can arc over. You see, that's an important thing to recognize. His coming has made this difference, so now we skate on the brink of the consummation for however long this goes on. Here's how Douglas Moo, a well-known New Testament scholar, this is in his commentary on James. Douglas Moo says, With the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the Spirit, the last days have been inaugurated. This final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here is the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. That's what Jesus said. No one knows the time. The length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last, Mark 13, 32. 
What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is, from the time of the early church to our own day, near or imminent. Every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia, that's the return of Christ, could occur at any time, and he means any time, not any moment, because there are certain things that will take place before then, but they can happen very rapidly. Now, there is another theological tradition that would say, no, you can be raptured and all this stuff. I'm not of that group. Okay, so when he says at any time, uh, can, can, he doesn't mean any moment. Okay, but that's just a footnote. But he says, every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia could occur at any time, and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. So it was as true in James's day as it is in ours. We need to be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. You and I as Christians live our lives in the shadow of his coming. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to conduct ourselves that way. Now John clearly identifies these antichrists as the false teachers. He doesn't leave any doubt about that. That's who he's referring to as Antichrist. He does that by stating that they went out from us. He knows who they are. They went out from us. And in chapter 2, verse 26, he specifies that he's writing about those who would deceive you. So here we have these false teachers who had started within the community of believers they had gone out, they had transcended them, they now reject the faithful community, and they're out teaching them and trying to pull them into their heresy. And so John says, look, lest this fact of origin, so he says that they went out from us, and then what I think John is doing is that he doesn't want the fact of their origin, that they originated with us, he doesn't want that to be misunderstood as giving these false teachers some kind of legitimacy so he makes clear that the false teachers were not part of the church. They went out from us, you see, but they're outside the boundaries of acceptable beliefs. They are not part of the church. He wants them to recognize that. In other words, when I say they went out from us, I don't mean that they are a variation within the larger community of faith that is accepted and tolerated. You know, we have different views, right? I mean, there, there are different ways of understanding things that are tolerated and accepted within the broader rope of the faith, right? I mean, we could, we could take, count heads here and you would see there's disagreements on certain things. He doesn't want them to think these people are like that. I'm not saying that, you see. He uses their act of secession to prove the point. They went out from us. By leaving the true church, they demonstrated that they were not of the church. When they seceded and went out and started dissing these guys and telling them they're not right and not loving them and rejecting them, he's using that to teach the community of the, the faithful community to say, do you see that they are not of us? They're not part of the community of faith. They are heretical. So John's not concerned here with the doctrine of eternal security that comes up. He's not concerned with the question of were they once really part of the church and then apostatized? You see, were they once really part of the church or were they never really part of the church and are now out there teaching here? That's not his concern. This gets seized on a lot in Calvinist debates and the idea is say, well, no, uh, you see here he says that they weren't part of it because part of the elect, the elect can never truly not be elect. <laughs> It's not his concern. His concern is that they understand that as of now, they are not of us. You see, and that's the present tense that he uses in verse 19. He says, but this happened that they might be exposed for none of them are of us. They're going out and they're seceding from the faithful community shows that they are outside the bounds of orthodoxy. He wants them to be armed against these people. Not to say, well, that's really great. Come on in and have access to the flock and teach them. No. You see, they're outside the bounds of that. So the false teachers, he, he here in 2.18 to 19, the false teachers, he says, are the antichrists of the last hour. And then in chapter 2, verses 20 to 23, he says, look, the readers are competent to judge false teachers. He encourages them. Anybody warm? 
Okay, good. I can never tell. I'll freeze the place out. He, he encourages them to say, listen, you are competent to judge false teachers. He tells them, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and know that every lie is not of the truth. Who is the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Now, who's that? That's these guys. You remember the very first class? I told you it wasn't filler when I did the introduction. <laughs> you see? You have to have something of the setting. And I went through who are these false teachers and what can we kind of glean about them and their false teaching. And one of the things is there's this Christological error, this idea of the nature. In some way, they're denying the incarnation of Jesus. They are denying that the eternal God the Son was manifested in the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so when he sits here and he says, look, he says, who's the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son also does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As I've said weeks ago, this is a package deal. You know, these people are like, you know, I just not Jesus, no, but I'm in line with God. No, you're not. Father, Son. Son, Father. Together. You see, so he tells them that. Now, he, John says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. See, he's confident that they have an adequate standard from which to judge heretics. And that confidence that they have an adequate standard from which to judge heretics is based on several things. First, they have an anointing from the Holy One. Now, I take this to mean that they had received the true gospel from Jesus Christ, the original, authentic message to which John referred in his prologue in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Remember, John says, look, we were there. We saw him. What I'm delivering to you is not some speculation like these false teachers. What I'm telling you is the straight, straight scoop. I was there. This is the original authentic message. And so they had, they, they had received that message. So what is this anointing? Okay, I take it to mean that they had received the true, authentic, original gospel message that the apostles had taken from Jesus himself and in conjunction therewith had received the Holy Spirit through whom they became increasingly aware of what was and was not compatible with the gospel. I see it, in other words, as a single reference to the word spirit package. Now, you can disagree with that, but I'm going to tell you why I think that. I think he's talking about the word spirit package. It, in, it involves their reception of the original authentic gospel, which is accompanied by the spirit who then helps internalize that message and helps us in our discernment as we are transformed more and more into the image of Jesus by the work of the spirit in our lives. So they're competent to judge because they have this anointing, which is word and spirit. Now, regarding the word aspect of the reference, you can see, for example, you see here he says, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you. Okay, well, I think the word is involved in that. Well, I look at the word. The word, you can say abides or remains, just different ways of translating that word. So it's the same word. But he says, the word of God remains or abides in you. In 2.24, let what you heard from the beginning, what? Remain in you. Second John 2, the truth that lives, or you could say abides in you. So one thing he's talking about, the anointing remains in you. And then I see in many places he speaks about the word, the message, the truth. It is something that remains in you. And also he says in chapter 2, verse 27, that the anointing teaches them, which is obviously true of the word of God. As I. Howard Marshall, he puts in his commentary, the word of God, it provides an objective basis from which to, from which to dispute the false teacher's claims to spiritual illumination or enlightenment. Here you have these people who are going out, they're referring to their heresy, which always happens, as enlightenment. 
as spiritual illumination. And here, the word provides an objective basis for saying, no, that's wrong. Oh, no, but I, no, that's wrong because this message and this truth and this word gives me a basis for recognizing that. Here's what Marshall says. If it is simply a matter of comparing claims to spiritual illumination, well, I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. I'm enlightened, I'm enlightened. I'm more enlightened. See, if, if, if that's all it is, he says one person's claim may be as good as another's. But if John rests his case on his reader's possession of the objective testimony of the word of God handed down in the church, then clearly his case rests on a solid foundation. So I think the word is part of this, but I don't think the word exhausts this. Because you have here the spirit aspect of the reference. You have here that the spirit, he says the anointing, the text I put up before, the anointing which you receive remains, abides in you. He says in John 14, 17, you know the spirit of truth, for he remains, abides, dwells, then with you, but he will be in the sense of dwelling and remaining in you. So I see here the same idea. The anointing is, remains in you, and the spirit of truth will remain or abide and be in you, dwell in you. So I see that parallel there. And then also, you see anointing is linked to the reception of the Spirit in a number of places. Like 1 Samuel 16, 13, Isaiah 61, 1, Acts 10, 38, and also look at 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, where this idea of the Spirit's uh, coming and being uh, received is referred to as an anointing. And you say, okay, so I see these two kind of things working together and that the two aspects are combined in this. When John says anointing, I think it's, it's word-spirit combination. And that idea that they are combined gains some plausibility from the fact that the distinction between spirit and word is not always sharp. You see, we may think of that spirit Word, but that distinction is not always sharp. For example, in John 6, 63, Jesus says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Right? So it seems to me that the borders are not as sharp as we may think. So when John speaks of this anointing that allows them or gives them competence to judge, I'm convinced he's speaking of this word spirit, spirit package. And as Stephen Smalley is a New Testament scholar, in his commentary on 1 John, he's echoing other people. But Stephen Smalley says, it may well be that, again, ambivalently. In other words, John doesn't spell this out by just this phrase anointing. You see, so I think he's kind of leaving it up there so both of these aspects can be accounted for. But he says, it may well be that, again, ambivalently, John is deliberately using the idea of chrisma, anointing, to signify both the Spirit and the Word of God. The faithful, that is to say, are those who have inwardly received the gospel truth and made it their own through the activity of the Spirit. See, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, and 6. Thereby they possess the antidote to heresy. That's how I'm seeing it. You see, that they have received, and he's expressing confidence in them that they have the means to understand and to judge these heretics. And then he says in 20b and 21, and you all know the truth. I do not write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it. Well, this is the flip side of the anointing. See, as a result of this anointing, as a result of your reception of the word and the concomitant reception of the Spirit of God, who then helps you internalize and transform you, you see, as a result of that, they know the truth. They have accepted and internalized the gospel. He says, I don't write to you because you don't know it, but because you know it. Well, yeah, yeah, I know it because I received it. And I've nailed it down and internalized it through the work of the Spirit in my life. I think that's what he's talking about. And then he tells them, he says, and know that every lie is not of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Or you could say every lie is not of the truth, which is how I did it. But he means no lie is of the truth. See, they're aware that lies aren't part of the truth. 
So they, they now have, by virtue of the anointing, they now have a standard. They now have the truth that makes them competent to judge heretics. And part of that is, is that they know that no, so they have the standard, and they also have the knowledge that no lie is of the truth. It's like light and darkness. You see, the two, are, the two are separate. The two are different. They're aware that lies aren't part of the truth, that they're opposed to one another. And so they won't be deceived into thinking that the false teachers who lie about Jesus are, in fact, part of the true church. He's sharing his confidence in them that they are capable of discerning that what he's telling them is right and that these people have nothing to do with Jesus and the church and are heretics, and you need to stay away from them. Don't give them an ear. Don't say they're deep. Don't do any of that. And he's expressing, I think, his confidence. Now, the doctrine of the false teachers is contrary to what they know is true. He says, who's the liar except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? The false teachers did that. They denied that Jesus is the Christ. This means they denied that the eternal Christ, God the Son, that he was in fact manifested, he became the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. Remember we talked before, first class, Docetists, one angle they would say, well, no, he only seemed to be. The divine only seemed to be that way. Or you had this idea of Serenthus. Well, no, it was temporary. There was a temporary inhabitation and then the divine left the man, Jesus. Okay, all of these things are heresies. They're heresies because Jesus is God incarnate. He's God incarnate. He's not like any of these other people. That's why, you know, I, I just go crazy when I hear him say, well, we got, we got uh, Buddha, we got Muhammad, we got Gandhi, and we got Jesus. And I'm going, Arr. what are you talking about? It's, it's, it's like, no, you don't have, they're not, they're not like the same. You've got all of these people, and you've got God incarnate. You see, so that, I, this, is, this is something that's important to recognize. He says that, he says, this one is, is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son also does not have the Father. He denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son also does not have the Father. And the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. See, their denial of the true identity of Jesus, that he is in fact God, become man. Their denial of his true identity was also a denial of God the Father. Now, why is that? Because God the Father is the one who sent the Son. He says in chapter 4, verse 10, and it's the Father who bears testimony to the Son. Chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. So when you wind up saying, no, he didn't, because Jesus is not the Son of God in the sense of God incarnate, well, who are you, who are you calling a liar? You are denying the Father because the Father sent the Son and the Father testifies to who the Son is. So he says here, look, he says, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Who's the Antichrist? This person who, who does that. As a consequence of their denial of Jesus' identity, see, their false Christology is the word, but because of that, they have no relationship with the Father. They are without salvation. That's just, that's a fact. By denying who Jesus is, we think, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you think about Jesus. Doesn't matter. You can think that he's just a guy there, but you know, a great wise teacher, but I still follow him and I'm into him, but I really have a relationship with God the Father. No, you don't. You don't. You see, you have to understand who he is and what he's done. They're without salvation. And John's readers, on the other hand, see, those who confess the truth about Jesus, Christians, the faithful. The Orthodox community, the people John's writing to, they're at peace. You see, they confess the truth about Jesus and what? They're in fellowship with the Father, as we are. You see, that's the great, that's the great joy of it, as we are. You see, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Yes. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes. You see, that's the idea. So in Christ... 
as we are faithful Christians who have received that message and trust in him, we are united with God, reconciled. Those who deny Jesus, I don't care what they say. They do not have a relationship with the Father. And then in verses uh, 24 and 25, he says, Let what you heard from the beginning remain in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And, and this is the promise which he has made to us, eternal life. You see, if they resist these false teachers, he has encouraged them and told them, I know that you're competent to do that. You have the truth in you. You've been anointed. You have the standard by which to judge them. Now, he urges them to exercise that competence which is theirs. He says, listen, you remain in them. If you resist the false teachers and you hold to the original message that was presented to you, the real deal, the message that we got from Jesus himself, not this adulterated thing, not this altered thing, the original, authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, you hold to that message, that message that we first presented to you, and you will remain in the Son and in the Father. You see, you hold to that, and the result of that faithfulness will be the eternal life which Jesus has promised. Now, this does say something about the importance of doctrine, doesn't it? Because what's he urging them to hold on to? Let what you heard remain in you. These beliefs. Somehow we've got the idea that, well, what I think and believe doesn't matter. You know, what I, I can think different things, and doctrine, you don't want to get hung up on doctrine. You don't want to get hung up on beliefs. Beliefs really aren't that significant. You see, because if you get on doctrine, that turns people off, and the millennials won't come. You see, and you, you, don't want to, you don't want to do that. What we want to do is, is have a more, you know, whatever it is, generalized kind of thing. And I'm saying to you that you see here in many other places, this obviously isn't unique, but you see that doctrine and what you believe, I was thinking, I think we would probably pass out if we handed out a survey in churches of the beliefs of the people. I'm afraid we would. There was a time that probably wasn't true. But my guess, I have no data for this, this is my, my sense, <laughs> is that we'd be shocked about the kind, and I'm talking about fundamental doctrines. You see, I'm not talking about esoteric things. I'm talking about pretty basic things. But I just want to see that, see, it's important, is if what you heard from the beginning remains in you, it's not something that's trivial. All right, 26 and 27, he says, I write these things to you concerning the ones who would deceive you. Well, who have you been talking about? Well, I'm writing to you about the ones who would deceive you. All right, I write these things to you concerning the ones who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it taught you, remain in him. You see, here, he, he, he re, this is a restatement where he characterizes, he assures, he exhorts, and he says, I write these things to you concerning the ones who would deceive you. He makes clear, you see, that these false teachers, they're pressing their doctrine. They're posing a threat to the faithful. They're not content to say, okay, uh, you guys are all wet. We've transcended you. We've got greater enlightenment. We've come to the deeper realization that God doesn't really care about this fallen material world. And we see all that. And they're not content with that to say, okay, we're going to go over here. No. They're going around and trying to pull people. Heretics always do that because they want you to share in what they claim is enlightenment. And so they're going around and they're trying to pull the people. He makes clear they're pressing their doctrine. That's why he's writing the letter. He's writing the letter to arm them against these people who are circulating around, and he is concerned about what they may do to the church. Then he says, he says, as for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. He assures his readers that they receive the true word of God, and since they're still holding to it, 
They were not in need of correction from anyone. Specifically thinking about the false teachers. They weren't spiritually inferior to these advanced teachers. This is what's going on when he says, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. He's referring in context to those people who are threatening them. He says, they got nothing to tell you. You can't pull this out abstractly and say, Christians don't need anybody to teach them. You see? No, no, no. You see, I have the Spirit. I don't need anybody to teach me. And that's how texts are sometimes used. And if you take them out of their context, you can make them say anything. That's why work is involved in trying to understand what is the context into which these things are written. And then it helps you get a feel and a shape for what does he mean by a statement like that. He's telling them, these guys have nothing to teach you. These guys are heretics. You don't have to listen to them. He doesn't want them to listen to them. They're not superior to you. I know they claim that, but they are not. You are the ones who are holding to the truth. You are the ones who are abiding in the, this truth about Jesus Christ. That word, that anointing is remaining in you. And then he says in, in the second part of 27, he urges his readers to adhere to that true original message that had been delivered to them just as that message teaches them to do. You see, he says, but as the same anointing teaches you about all things and is true and not and just as it taught you, remain in him. See, part of that message was is that you need to walk and be faithful to the end. So that very message teaches you to abide in him and to remain in him. Is that the first bell? Yes. All right, you see? Ha. All right. Now, 228 to 324 in my way of understanding. He's going to speak about the ethical component of abiding in Christ. He's talked about this doctrinal aspect and these convictions that are part of abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ. What you believe about the nature of Jesus, this is in response to the Christological error of these heretics, that Jesus isn't really God the Son who became the historical person Jesus of Nazareth. So he's telling them, listen, you need to hold to that truth, that doctrinal content, okay, those convictions that are part of the original gospel. Well, now he speaks about the ethical component of abiding in Christ. You remember, they had a Christological errors and they had ethical errors. And so he's now going to address this ethical component of remaining or abiding in Christ. And he says in 228 through 310 that abiding involves, remaining involves right living. And the first thing he's going to do, as I see it, is right living. He's going to speak about right living and Christ's return. Right living and Christ's second coming, which he does in 228 through 33. Okay, he says, and now little children, remain in him so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And we are. On account of this, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we now are children of God and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as that one is pure. All right, he says, he says in, in 28, he amplifies the significance of this remaining that he just mentioned in, in verse 27. He amplifies the significance of that. It's the difference between confidence and shame at Christ's coming. You remain, as I'm urging you to do and as you're competent to do, to reject these false teachers. You remain in Jesus. And your remaining there is the difference between confidence and shame at his coming. By shame, what is it? Here, here comes Jesus at his second coming. It's time for judgment. And what are you? You're ashamed because you haven't been faithful. 
you have rejected and turned from him after all he gave you. What's the other? Confidence. Why? Because of you? No. You're confident, though, because you've remained in the one who is salvation. You see, and so it's the difference between, between those two. If they will remain in Christ, if they will hold to what they've had given to them from the beginning, then when Christ appears as judge, they may be confident and unashamed. You see, we as Christians don't live our lives like this. Am I going to be lost? Am I going to be lost? Oh, okay, you know, that's, if that's how you live, it's crazy. We're not spiritual neurotics. We understand that we're flawed. We understand that we're sinful. But we also understand that we're in love with the one who saved us. All right? So, okay. So, because of who he is, I love him. I serve him. You don't do it perfectly. Okay, I'm not even going to say it again. Uh, all right, but, but you see, but, but you understand that. Somebody asks you, you love, you love your wife? Do you love your husband? Well, how do you know you love them? How do you know you're loyal to them? How do you know you're faithful to them? Do you live, I heard that bell, do you live that perfectly? Would your wife say he's the perfect man? Only, only Linda Miller would say that. Where's Linda? <laughs> She's not in here. But see, would they do that? No, but, then, but you understand the difference. You say, okay, no, I haven't always lived out my devotion to her and, and my commitment to her welfare perfectly, but I understand the difference between that and having rejected her, okay? Well, that's the idea, and if you've held on to that, well, then be at peace, okay? Just be at peace and celebrate the greatness of the God we serve. Okay, out next week, got John, bring those dark glasses, thanks. Yeah.